everyone and welcome to Coast Connections. I'm Elizabeth Hines and today we're connecting with an institute that has a national and international uh, focal point for uh, fishery and aquatic research here in Canada. They're world leaders. Their building is actually a national historic site and they produce not one but four members of their staff over time have become members of the Order of Canada quite commendable for the workplace, which is called the Pacific Biological Station. And our guests tonight are Sarah, Dr. Sarah Dudas from the Pacific Biological Station and Sean McConaughey. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Very Thank nice you to have you here. It's good to be here. <laughs> yeah, very brave of you too. <laughs> You're sort of outside your comfort zone. We're not uh, on the water. We're not right. out collecting specimens. We're just having an interview That's indoors right. tonight. Yeah. 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 No lab coats. Kind of <laughs> no, no, exactly. You left those at the door. That's right. Yeah. Sean, let's talk a little bit about the, na um, the national significance of the building. Sure. It's sure. the um, building that everybody sees coming in and out of the Nanaimo Harbor. It's yep. the iconic building there. Right. I think we've got a nice uh, black and white shot of it that we're going to be showing here as well. So it's over 100 years old. That's right. So the first biological station started in 1908, actually, by a gentleman named Reverend Taylor, started uh, a research center there. Mm -hmm. um, and it's been growing and changing and morphing over the decades. Um, we currently have about 300, 350 plus staff, sort of oscillates throughout the year, but uh, really quite extraordinary how much has grown. And, and I can't imagine what it must be like in the early 1900s yes. to, you know, few vehicles of any to be out there in the middle of Departure Bay. Uh, out there doing the beginning of fisheries research on this mm -hmm. west on the west coast. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's a it's a very uh, very neat place to work at with lots of fun stories and uh, lots of interesting developments over the over the over the decades. And to see it change, I've been there. Well, I've been in the department now about 20 years, 21 years, and at PBS itself for the last 10 to 12. And just to see the changes in that short amount of time, it's uh, it's really interesting. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very good. And uh, Sarah, you're relatively new to PBS. Uh, last couple of years, I think you joined. I, mm -hmm. I joined the department two years ago mm -hmm. uh, after leaving a, an academic position and joined the team in the marine spatial ecology and analysis section uh, to conduct research to help identify important species in important areas uh, to identify them for potential conservation measures. So it's been really exciting, a really exciting time to join the, de the department. A lot of exciting new initiatives that are happening that are coastwide and very collaborative so it's been it's been a lot of fun already over these last two years nice and it's nice to have the two perspectives you know Sean with your 20 plus years and Sarah just coming in with the you know relatively new to the organization yeah. that's that's really good yeah well it has been a huge exciting change over the last six years we've hired lots of new staff and tons of investments in new, new technology mm -hmm. um, we're kind of bursting out the seams in some ways. So uh, quite a bit different than about six, seven, eight, nine years ago. So it's, it's a great change. And you are affiliated with the center in Sydney as well, right? That's part of the uh, fisheries and oceans. That's right. So yeah. one of our, our one of our sister research centers is the Institute of Ocean Sciences mm -hmm. at uh, Pat Bay down by Sydney. And they're more focused on the oceanographic and physical sciences uh, of the marine environment. Um, at PBS itself, we're more focused, not entirely, but mostly on uh, sort of fisheries and fish and the biology side of, of the equation. As opposed to the geography That's of, right. of the yeah. ocean floor. Yeah, yeah. yeah. oceanography. Well. Oceanography, there That's you right. go. <laughs> Got to think underwater. That's here. right, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, Sean, you're a marine mammal specialist. Well, um, I, I'm, I'm just a regular biologist, but I, uh, I'm the manager for what we call the aquatic ecosystems and marine mammal science. Mm -hmm. So I oversee all the marine mammal research uh, out here on the West Coast for, mm -hmm. for DFO. And uh, yeah, it's, it's been, a, again, a time of growth. and. Oversee uh, research on um, larger cetaceans, the big baleen type whales, uh, as well as pinnipeds, seals and sea lions, mm -hmm. uh, sea otters, and also, uh, of course, killer whales, which mm -hmm. is a, a large area of research right now. Right, yeah. yeah. And what is the status right now of some of our, our whale populations, especially the killer whales? Have been right, so within uh, killer whales, we have four different ecotypes or mm -hmm. sort of subpopulations, if you will. Um, of course, qu quite well known is the southern resident killer whales. We hear a lot about that in the news. Uh, but we also have northern resident killer whales, and those two populations uh, predominantly eat fish or eat fish exclusively. <laughs> then we have uh, bigs or transient killer whales, and those ones that eat marine mammals. And then we have another ecotype that we called offshores. We don't know much about them, but they're off the they're well, well named, they're offshore. So I don't see them very often, but we think they predominantly eat sharks. Um, because all their teeth, whenever you find their teeth, they're all ground down. And because sharks and rays have very rough skin, that's why we figure that their teeth are being ground down by, 
why he didn't know. So, wow. but we don't we don't see those very often. Uh, but with the southern residents and northern residents, lots of research looking at how those two populations are are growing, while northerns are growing, uh, whereas southerns have been declining quite a bit over the last few years. So. Uh, yeah, it's really a huge investment and it's uh, exciting times. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you have a favorite marine mammal that you've been studying over the years? <laughs> no. No? <laughs> <laughs> well, they're all interesting. They all have, exactly. they all have uh, interesting <laughs> dynamics. Uh, it's amazing with killer whales, I think, especially in, in my lifetime, you know, when I was a, a young, young child, you know, they were, they were reviled. People didn't like killer whales. Mm -hmm. you know, they, were, they were disturbing the commercial fishery. They were you know, known as killers. Uh, and now, you know, 40, 50 years later, they are revered and, you know, a, an icon to the West Coast. So quite a dramatic change. Very much. So yeah. it's, and, and the, the passion that people have for these animals is absolutely uh, overwhelming, actually. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's probably going to help save them as well, right? Well, it's certainly, it certainly uh, keeps, the, keeps us uh, keeps on us and keeps the profile on, that's mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, it creates great opportunities for collaboration as well mm -hmm. with all sorts of different folks. So it's good. Yeah, it is. And we'll talk a bit about some of those uh, collaborations a little further on. Yeah. And on the end of, end of the scale, Sarah, you're dealing with more of the very tiny species that we're finding in some of these intertidal waters. And there was one species that's about the size of an apple seed, I think, that you said. I forget what that was, some little... The mussels, yeah. the blue mussels, which when they, when they settle, they're teeny tiny. You can hardly see them at all. And as they grow, uh, you can get to see them better and better for that particular photo that they had taken. It was a piece of algae that I had found that looked like it was covered in tiny little rocks, but it was all tiny little mussels. But huh. the work that I do covers things from infinitesimally small to, I don't go quite up to the marine, <laughs> marine mammals, but yeah. study fish as well. Mm -hmm. So it covers a whole range of different creatures. Mm -hmm. The biodiversity within our oceans, we've only begun to just sort of tap uh, what's in there. Yeah. It's incredible. Um, yesterday I had a lovely tour of your facility. Thank you very much. And one of the things that was really surprising was all those massive freezers that you had deep down in the basement um, set at like minus 85 degrees. Yep. And there was hundreds of thousands of specimens of all kinds of different sea creatures and things in there. Okay. That's incredible. How many years have you collecting those there. Oh, for, for a long time mm -hmm. now. So those, uh, those freezers are specifically uh, designed to um, keep things frozen for molecular genetic analysis. Yep. And uh, the genetics lab at PBS uh, has grown dramatically over the last 20, 30 years. So we're really a, truly a world leader in uh, fish genetics. And uh, so those freezers, which are you know, quite pricey uh, and you suck up a lot of power, are used there to, to maintain those samples uh, for for future analysis, if we need to go back to them, so mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's again been a big investment, and it's been a lot of change, but it's uh, a lot more efficient than the old chest freezers that uh, you know, that my granny used to have. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So it's uh, yeah, and the the whole uh, molecular genetics lab, as we say, run by uh, Terry Beecham. Um, it's it's extraordinary what they've done uh, to take uh, a relatively not a relatively uh, a a very slow, uh, arduous process of defining and figuring out what populations of fish belong to what rivers. And now they can run thousands of samples in a matter of 24 hours just with the new technologies that have been developed. Wow. Yeah, wow. yeah it's, it's very impressive, yeah. Very impressive, that was yeah. really interesting. And Sarah, uh, you recently got back from, was it Goose Island on one of your um, expeditions? And we've got a few photos of that uh, that we're gonna show you here. Uh, our viewers, they're going to pop those up in a second. But tell us a little bit about what you were doing there um, in the intertidal zone, what you were looking for and your, your colleagues. The Goose Island trip that we did was part of a three-week expedition that spanned the entire coast from Hartley Bay all the way up the northern central coast all the way down to Sandwich Inlet. Wow. And it was a cruise that had a number of different programs involved. Over 10 different programs were supported by that uh, cruise, all related to finding new species and trying to figure out where every where the creatures are mm -hmm. and what habitats are really important. That particular day at Goose Island was a lot of fun. We had Ocean Networks Canada out with us, uh, as well as Hackeye Magazine, who uh, joined us and did that wonderful story on it. And we had a crew out on the rocky intertidal zone, looking at all the different creatures living on the rocks and literally getting down on our stomachs and, and 
sticking our head in our crevices trying to find all the different types of animals that are living in those spaces. And then we also had a crew led by Emily Rubidge down in the eelgrass meadow doing beach mm -hmm. saints and looking at all the fish living in those spots. So it was a really uh, neat day and we had several of those days where we were kind of like a SWAT team in the intertidal zone hitting all of the creatures, the invertebrates, which are creatures without backbones, living in that rocky intertidal area. And then the fish crew working on all the fish species that mm -hmm. are living and supported by those wonderful eelgrass meadows that support such diversity. So it was really fun to get both of those habitats covered. Very intense because you have that short window of time when that tide recedes. Right. And so you have a very limited window to get a lot of things done at once and get as much data as we possibly can to learn about that place. And mm -hmm. Goose Island is such a neat place because it has beautiful rocky intertidal areas, sandy areas, these beautiful eelgrass meadows. And it was, it was an intense but a very fun day. Yeah. Um, I think in that article, um, Sarah, you mentioned that this is your church, like being out in there, um, the, the in nature like that in the raw, it's just what an incredible experience to be doing that type of research. And it's a very calming place mm -hmm. to be for me. It's, it is a very important place that I'm very passionate about the oceans. I've wanted to be a marine biologist since I was 13. So it's a very, a very special place for me. And even though it does take me away from my family because it's such a special place, I believe strongly in dedicating time to making sure that we're protecting what we need to, to make sure there's that legacy for our children and taking that time to talk to journalists have those articles written to share that passion with others who might not realize what an incredible, diverse coastline that we have. Mm, yeah, it's, it's, and we're only, as I say, we've only begun to sort of scratch the surface of it Absol to, to find out what's there. And yeah. Yeah. Part of that cruise was doing some deep water remotely operated vehicle surveys. So that really is kind of one of the new frontiers. Everybody sees space as the last, mm. the final frontier, but I think those deeper waters are a final frontier as well. Yeah. <laughs> Deep seas where it's at. Deep seas where it's yeah. at. And um, yesterday <coughs> on the tour, we saw a really um, amazing hydrophone that was there. Right. Um, Sean, tell us a little bit about the hydrophone and what you're capturing there and why. Right. So one of the technologies we use to detect whales is a hydrophone, which are called passive acoustic monitoring. Mm -hmm. So a hydrophone is really just a, a fancy underwater microphone. And it's hooked up to a, a recorder uh, with a lots and lots of batteries. And we put it in, uh, into some special casing and, and deploy it into the water in different spots throughout the coast. And the hydrophone will turn on periodically and listen and uh, record that data. And different species of whales predominantly make different noises, different sounds. And uh, through different software, when we retrieve the hydrophone, uh, we put the, the data through different softwares to detect if there's a whale, then classify it into what species. And then we, our technicians and biologists uh, confirm or validate those uh, findings. And what can be challenging if we're looking, say, for killer whales, well, humpback whales also make similar sounds at similar uh, frequencies. So it requires a lot of uh, human effort to make sure that what we think is killer whales are actually humpbacks or vice versa. Um, because the ocean is a really big place, so it's very difficult to be able to visually observe all these animals. So we're, so we're using these hydrophones uh, in, in offshore areas and, and inshore. Um, typically for the offshore deployments, we uh, will drop a hydrophone off at say sea mounts and we'll leave them there for out over a year collecting data and try to get back out uh, on our big research vessels to, to retrieve this and then spend you know, another six to nine months listening to what's being uh, recorded. And these things can be deployed uh, hundreds, if not like a thousand meters. So we're listening for all sorts of different sorts of whales. Mm -hmm. um, for uh, southern residents uh, and the interaction, southern resident killer whales, I should say, and the interactions with uh, marine shipping, we uh, have deployed a whole series of hydrophones collecting data 24-7 uh, to get an understanding of what the sort of the acoustic baseline is within the Strait of Georgia and Juan de Fuca area. Um, and currently we've been having a program uh, run by Dr. Svein Vagel down at Institute Ocean, Ocean Sciences um, where across all these different hydrophones we now have over 300 terabytes worth of acoustic data that we're processing to understand you know, how noisy is this environment and where does the noise come from and um, both 
uh, anthropogenic, human-made, and and ambient. You know, it's a it's a big place and it is noisy. Yeah. So. So how is that information going to be used then for uh, conservation efforts or um, right. preservation? Well, so we're working with our colleagues in Transport Canada mm -hmm. to understand uh, as they have the jurisdiction to move vessels in different uh, areas, what does that do to reduce the, the noise impact on the environment? It's not just for whales, it's for many other species as well. Um, some, depending on the vessel type and where they are up in, the, in, the, in that area, uh, the impacts can be pretty significant or pretty minimal by doing these changes. So, um, and also because we have now this baseline of data, as marine shipping changes, either increases or decreases, or different vessel types, we'll have an understanding what those changes actually are. Mm -hmm. So we're actually collecting uh, real data, not just modeled data, which is quite often used. So uh, again, it's, a, it's been a significant investment and, and a lot of work, but it's a, it's a great piece of information that we'll be able to use mm -hmm. in the future to help other people make those, those tough conservation decisions. Exactly. Yeah. And Sarah, you were mentioning that um, the hydrophones are also um, being pioneered for um, the sounds that fish emit and how different those are. Tell us a yes. bit about that. I, I've had the opportunity to be involved in a project looking at the use of hydrophones and picking up fish sounds. And this is something, an application that's lesser well known, but fish make a lot of different noises. Hmm. And part of the challenge in using the hydrophone as a tool for measuring fish or measuring what fish are out there is just figuring out who makes what noise. Mm -hmm. So the use of, of what we call passive acoustics for monitoring fish or detecting fish is really uh, just in its starting stages, certainly on our coast where we don't know the sounds of a lot of fish. But luckily we have a whole team of people. We're working with our colleagues at the University of Victoria uh, who are working on trying to identify individual fish, fish species specific calls. <laughs> so that we can start looking at using that as a way of monitoring fish and fish abundance because it is t quite time consuming to get divers out there or to get a remotely operated vehicle out there. So, uh, you know, it may seem outrageous many years down the line that we had to go out there and dive and count things. Yeah. Who knows where yeah, that technology true. will or, take yeah. us. Or dragging that through the water and yeah. you know, take the fish take out, the fish That's out. Right. which exactly. is sort of a, you know, yeah. A species right. of risk, you tend not to want to do that. No, we, we don't like that. <laughs> no, that's right. So who knows, soon we might be all speaking, you know, trout and salmon and <laughs> halibut. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Um, now, you're, you're out on expeditions, obviously, on the Vector. You mentioned one of the ships. But, uh, Sean, you've got a brand new vessel yeah, we're really pulling into the dock. Uh, the, the Franklin, James Franklin. Um, it's a new research platform. Uh, it's been uh, part of the... The vessel recruitment program uh, that the government's in, embarked on. Uh, so this is the first of uh, one of three new research platforms that are being built. Uh, she's just in the midst of being commissioned and tested right now, and we're hoping for uh, the first science expedition in the spring, maybe April, maybe May. So uh, uh, the Ricker was our former research fisheries uh, platform predominantly. Named after your um, preeminent scientist. That's right, uh, Dr. Yeah. Uh, Bill Ricker. Ricker. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, she gave many, many decades of great service, but uh, uh, she'd she done her bit. Uh, so we're ready for this new vessel. I think it's gonna be able to uh, you know, literally take us places we've never been and, and uh, enable us to do new research that uh, we couldn't dream of in the past. So they're still working out a few uh, uh, little bits here and there, as with all new vessels, but uh, so we're very excited to mm -hmm. To, to get on board and get out there. That's exciting. Yeah. And also, um, as you say, it was part of the um, National Shipbuilding Program right. and it was built right in Vancouver through C-SPAN, which right, is yeah. really good yeah. to know. And actually, uh, the the second one, I think, is has been launched and is under sea trials and the third one is being completed right now. Mm -hmm. And those two are headed off to the East Coast. Mm -hmm. So There you go. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be... Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very eager to get out. Mm -hmm. yeah, that'll be fun. And I'm sure there'll be a, a wonderful ceremony when it does arrive here um, to launch it here at, at the uh, the uh, PBS. That's so, right, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we'll get all the gear and head out to sea. It'll be fun. <laughs> there yeah. we go. Um, well, let's talk a little bit, um, Sarah, about the First Nations partnerships that you have as well, because you consult with uh, First Nations uh, very frequently and um, respectfully in your work. That's right. We. We're all residents of this coast, the First Nations. We're the first people to be here and have so much knowledge about this coastline, far more 
far more than we do. So when we embarked on the planning for the survey that we did last May, uh, we talked to the nations whose territories that we would be in and started that conversation about we want to come up to these areas, we have a ROV, we have some intertidal gear, what would you like to know? Mm -hmm. And where would you like more information? And so we really co-developed the plan for the work uh, so that we could collect the information in the places that would provide information that would be useful to the nations whose territory that we were doing it mm -hmm. in and useful to help us in our effort to protect our coastlines. So it was really a kind of a co-developed vision how we would do that. And the data that we collect is all open and shared uh, so that anybody can use it. Uh, and we were lucky to have some some of the members come out and join us and we had a class from one of the communities come out for one day. So it's really nice to have a chance to work together mm -hmm. and to learn from the First Nations who know their knowledge is so rich about the coastline. We really can learn so much from them. Very ancient wisdom that they're bringing. So these cross-cultural connections are really important for both parties. And you also don't go into areas that are culturally sensitive. Um, That's right. First Nations. That's right. We're very sensitive to those areas that, that are very special and need to be left need to be left alone, especially because some of the types of work that we're doing is invasive. We're digging mm -hmm. up the clams on the beach. Right. You don't yeah. want to be doing that in an area that is important for other reasons or that they're going to be harvesting from or disturbing areas that are important for their lives. That's good to know because yeah. it benefits everybody. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Now, um, Sean, yesterday when I was um, on the tour, you mentioned something that I'd never heard about before, how you can measure the age of a fish just like the rings of a tree, fish have something called an... An otolith. Otolith. So it's also considered their ear bone, and it uh, grows in their back of the head. Not all fish have them, but most do. And as the fish age on a daily and, and of course, annual basis, they lay down rings uh, very much like a tree. Uh, so you can actually age the fish by counting the number of rings within the otolith. Uh, depending on the species of the otolith, it can be, you know, good size like this. Some are very, very small. And we have a, quite a, an advanced lab at PBS called the Sclerochronology Lab, uh, called the Fish Aging Lab to make it easy, uh, who uh, undertake uh, studies of thousands of fish every year, mm. counting all these rings to get an understanding of the age structure uh, within different populations of uh, fish. Mm. So uh, earlier on we mentioned the rockfish conservation areas, that you know these fish can live in up to 90 years. And, uh, to understand um, uh, the fishing dynamics on that sort of population, it's really important to know what the age structure is because you don't want to be fishing out the old fish, right. if, especially if there's no young ones coming up. So uh, the scler sclerochronology lab has played a really foundational piece in, to inform lots of the stock assessment for many species that, mm. uh, that are harvested on our coast. So it's a, and, and again, that, that uh, research has been uh, informing lots of other institutes around, around the country and around the globe. It's fascinating. Yeah. Um, like the rings of a tree can be judged by the type of seasons that they had. It was a harsh winter or a good drought summer. That's right. How does that work on a fish? Because they're underwater. They're not really <clears throat> getting a seasonal adjustment. Or are they? Like. Well, th there are seasonal adjustments. Mm -hmm. So certainly, well, again, depending on the species and where they live in the ocean and the depths that they live, uh, if they're more uh, up at the surface water column, they will be affected yeah. by t uh, changes in temperatures and the amount of feed that they grow. Uh, are available for their growth. Mm -hmm. So certainly within any given year, you can see changes in those patterns of the minerals that are laid down. Um, also with many of our salmon species, of course, they lay down you know, within the freshwater, then the marine, then back to the fresh. And, and it's not just about counting the rings. We can use this thing called laser ablation, mm -hmm. which is a, you fire a little laser beam and a little puff of dust comes up and then through chemical analysis, you can look at different isotopes. Yeah, it's. It's very, That's you know, super cool stuff, yeah. yeah. And uh, it's a way to detect, you know, where are some of these populations from. Yeah. So in a lot of our survey methods, we can find uh, where the big fish are, but we don't know where the nurseries are. Mm -hmm. So from a, from a conservation perspective, knowing where nursery areas for certain species is also really important. Mm -hmm. And looking at sort of chemical signatures might inform that, so. Fascinating. Yeah, there's, yeah. And, and the, you know, the science of this is growing all the time. Yeah. yeah. You scientists are having too much fun. It, <laughs> yeah, don't tell anyone. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> and Sarah, what would you say to other women or girls who are, you know, thinking of a career in science? 
uh, what would you say to inspire them to get involved and get their hip waders on and get down and dirty with the little mollusks? I, I would say what I said to the grade two classrooms that I had the chance to get into last spring for Earth Week, and that's we're all scientists already to some extent. You really don't, we have a lot of fancy gear as, as Sean's been telling you about, but all you need is a pencil and a paper. That's all you need. Record observations, record them over time. What do you see? Describe it. You are already a scientist. I also encourage students that whatever passion you have, if you're an artist, there's a way to turn your art into science or to apply that to science. So even For those sure. people who think that, oh, I'm not very sciencey in science, you think somebody in a lab co coat, and we're trying to break that stereotype, science wearing the hip waders, science out there with your yeah. gumboots and a bucket. And a bucket. So yeah. you don't have to see yourself as a math type mm. of chemistry person. There's lots of different ways to apply your skills and knowledge in science. And the sky's the, the, sky's the limit. Mm -hmm. You're already a scientist now. You've already made observations about things in your life or things outside, seen seasonal changes. You already have a lot of the skills in you yeah. to be a scientist, yeah. to think critically and ask questions and make observations. I like that. You make it sound far less intimidating <laughs> speaking to someone who has her PhD. Yeah. <laughs> Get out and observe, like be in the moment. That's right. Yeah. Um, Sean, speaking of scientists, there was a couple of very preeminent scientists at the PBS who were awarded the Order of Canada That's this right. year. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, well, our, two, our two colleagues down, they're actually down at IOS at Institute, mm -hmm. they're uh, Eddie Carmack and Robbie McDonald. And we have pictures of them that we're showing. Yeah, yeah. okay. Uh, so. Um, most of their work associated with lots of research over the decades uh, in the Arctic, mm -hmm. which again is another new frontier of research. And so those are uh, two of our colleagues that have uh, Order Canada. Um, at PBS, we've actually had uh, four other colleagues yeah. over the decades have received them. Uh, Dick Beamish, who's uh, still, still uh, we call uh, emeritus. He still comes into work uh, three, four or five days a week. Love it. Yeah, and just uh, loves his job and, and yeah. is committed to it. Um, uh, Dr. of course, Bill Ricker, who's, mm -hmm. you know, you know, well known throughout Nanaimo, and you know his research is foundational to all stock assessment around the planet. That's so you know it's extraordinary when yeah. you think about it, and you know it's you know I take great I'm very humbled by it and take great pride in it as well that you know I get to work at a place where you know standing on the the shoulders of giants. And just to put that in perspective, four of your staff members with um, who who are recipients of the Order of Canada, that's been since 1967. There's been 7,500 awards. Um, and two of those awards went to two of your colleagues in our country, and we've got like almost 40 million people. That's so right. that's Definitely. tremendous. It's very exciting. Yeah, yeah and a great exciting. honor and a great, uh, and a great accolade to their to their hard work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I look forward to the day that you're going to be up there oh, with yeah, the Governor yeah, General yeah. receiving your <laughs> <laughs> Orders of Canada. I'm sure that's on the way. Well, all the way. To yeah. Work. We've run out of time today, but I want to thank you so much for the work that you're doing to help preserve our coastline for our future generations and for our own enjoyment out here on the coast. So safe travels, and um, thank you so much for coming in. We'll have thank you back. Much. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. And thank you for joining us on Coast Connections. And go out there, start paying a little more attention to our coastline, and you too might end up being a scientist at PBS. Thank you.